Good day, good afternoon, or rather good evening, whichever part of the world you might be. This is the Biblicist, and today let's have a look at this passage, Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Like now some objections people end up throwing is, since Jesus did not condemn the woman according to the law, did Jesus actually break the law? Okay, now most of his Christians would be aware about this passage, so I'll just give a short summary about it. Okay. So, it's from John 7.53, that's the last verse of chapter 7 of John's Gospel, and it goes all the way till John 8, verse number 11. Okay. So, you know that the Jewish leaders bought a woman who was apparently caught in adultery to Jesus. And they asked him, like, according to the Mosaic law, the Torah, she should be put to death. And they asked him his opinion, should we do it? And we know that uh, Jesus wrote on the ground and said he was without sin, cast the first stone. And then he writes once more on the ground and the people do not condemn, who wanted to condemn her, they go away, starting with the older ones first and then the younger ones. And then Jesus finally says to the woman that, uh, sin no more, I haven't condemned you either. So what's all this immediate context about? Now it kind of looks like Jesus actually went against the law and uh, that leaves us, leaves us with a bit of a dilemma. Did Jesus actually break the law? But Jesus himself said that he's come to fulfill the law, right? Okay. So, to understand what's going on in this passage, we need to understand three things. One thing is the immediate context of the situation. That's point number one. Then, point number two would be the actual context of the Mosaic law, because Jesus was again judging the, her, her persecutors using the Mosaic law itself. And then there are also some Christological implications, which have got to do with Jesus being God. All right. Okay. So we'll look at each of these things in a bit more depth to understand what's going on in this passage. So now given the historical context, Jews, or rather the region of Judea, take note, this is the region of Judea. They were directly under Roman occupation. Okay. So Rome conquered much of the world by the end of the first century BC, okay? And of course, the kingdom of Judea was subject to them with the three Herods ruling over a part of the place, three or I think four Herods ruling over it, along with the governor Pilate, subject to the Roman emperor at Jesus' point of time. So naturally, even if the Jews wanted to kill somebody, they could not do so directly, okay? It had to come with the approval of Rome. So what they were asking Jesus was, okay, so Moses tells her we should condemn her, all right? But what's your opinion? And Jesus knew that this was a loaded question, okay? Because if he said that, fine, go ahead and condemn her, then they could incite the Romans against him. That's one thing. So he would be breaking the law of Rome. And if he said, no, don't stone her, then they would say, ah, you're a false prophet, man. Please go away. You're, you're a frony, you're a fraud. This is what would have happened. So you see the situation over here? So how does Jesus outsmart them and get out of this? Okay. So let's look into the Mosaic law, okay? Now, there are some passages which you need to be clear about because when the Pharisees were saying that an adulterer has to be stoned, they were appealing to some passages like these, like Leviticus chapter 20, verses 10 to 12, and Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse number 22. All right, so I'll just go to Bible Gateway and skim through these verses. 
Give me a minute. Okay, so flipping over to Bible Gateway. I'm just going to the said passage first, John 7:53 to John 8:11. And everyone went to his house, his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, they're appealing to these verses in the law. If I'm going to Leviticus chapter 20, verses 10 to 12. Again, I'm using the New King James Version. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. Okay? The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. So even in cases of incest, even that's banned, condemned rather, by the Mosaic law. And same thing with homosexual relations. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man mar marries a mother, marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. Again, they shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there, that there may be no wickedness among you. Anyway. And the other verse was in Deuteronomy 22. Again, the full section on sexual morality. So in Deuteronomy, it's just Moses reiterating what was taught to them before in Exodus, in Numbers, and in Leviticus. It's just the, the same thing reiterated again in Deuteronomy as part of Moses' farewell address before he goes up to Mount Nebo and dies. All right. Okay, here we go. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. Okay. Now, coming back to the actual context of this passage here, back to John 8. They are appealing to the Mosaic law. That's true. But now, they have messed up here. Okay, the passage doesn't say anything about where is the man with whom she committed adultery. Uh-oh, that's a problem now. Okay. They said this testing him because they might have something to accuse of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Okay. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Now, this particular statement of Jesus, it carries a lot of weight as far as the Mosaic law is concerned. I'll tell you why. Because first of all, according to the Mosaic law, both the man and the woman shall be put to death. But they are only about the woman. They are only talking about the woman, where is the man? Okay, and now coming to this statement, I'll show you what it exactly means. So now let's skip over to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. And uh, okay. Here we go. So in Deuteronomy 17, okay, here we go, verses 2. If there is found among you within any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, 
as in any of your cities or any of your towns or any of your villages which god gives them when they're about in their promised land because over here they're just on the verge of invading the promised land so a man or a woman who has been wicked in the sight of the lord your god and transgressing his covenant who has gone and served other gods and worshiped them either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven which i have not commanded and it is told you and you hear of it that you shall inquire diligently and if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination has been committed in israel then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has committed that wicked thing and shall stone to death that man or woman with stones whoever is deserving of that shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses he shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness okay now take a note of this verse like in the mosaic law i just showed you in leviticus 20 it was this 10 to 12 on in Deuteronomy 22 verse 22 like for any crime which is punishable by that you need to have at least two witnesses at least two or three witnesses not one witness okay the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put to death and afterwards the hands of all the people now see this verse is very significant so if i am the witness and if my testimony is to be true then me and my other witness we can be the first people to throw the stones against this person so you shall put away the evil among you okay so this is the significance of jesus saying he who is without sin among you let them throw a stone at our first so according to the mosaic law again jesus judged them using the mosaic law itself two or three witnesses now let's go to deuteronomy 19 and now this is where it gets interesting okay in deuteronomy 19 okay let me look for the word two yeah So Deuteronomy 19, very specifically, verses 15 to 20. I'll just write that down here. 15 to 20, this part of the passage. The law concerning witnesses, okay? One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits by the mouth of two or three witnesses. The matter shall be established. Okay, so you need, again, two or three witnesses. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges in serve, who serve in those days. Now, verses 16 to 17, take a note, people. If it happens to be a false witness, then both the witness, or rather the witnesses, and the person to whom the crime is being imputed to, shall stand before the lord that is before the priests and the judges who serve in those days okay and the judges shall make careful inquiry and indeed if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother so you shall put away the evil from among you So what does this mean? You shall put away the evil from among you. Stone that person to death if that person happens to be a false witness. And those who remain shall hear and fear and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. So you see, so what are... What the scribes and the Pharisees did were who bought that woman along they have borne false witness why because number one according to the mosaic law both the man and the woman should be brought forward and they should be put to death but in this case they have just bought the woman where is the man so technically they have borne false witness number two if their testimony is true then they'll be the first people to hurl the stones are at the woman okay if it so happened but if their testimony is false they will be the ones to whom this judgment will be committed okay so here jesus says he who is without sin among you let him throw a stone at her first they have borne false witness 
and therefore they have committed a crime which is punishable by that according to the mosaic law and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience there you go went out one by one beginning with the oldest even to the last and jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst when jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman he said to her woman where are those accusers of yours has no one condemned you she said no one lord and jesus said to her neither do i condemn you go and sin no more so according to the mosaic law they didn't even fulfill the criterion okay so not only did jesus deliver himself out of this one he also showed these guys their place okay now i'm going to the christological implications of this passage and uh, i hope you will be edified with what you're about to hear concerning the christological implications of this passage now when it comes to interpreting scripture properly there is a science called as typology where people make connections from the old and the new testament with verses which sound very similar or alike they are able to draw some more conclusions so based on this people interpret prophecy people interpret the things like jesus being divine the holy spirit being divine the trinity even the early church fathers interpret a lot of other things like mary being the ark of the covenant and so on and so forth okay but part of interpretation called as typology and even the new testament authors appealed a lot to typology to draw parallels about jesus being the messiah jesus being god in the flesh so on and so forth all right so based on this there are some christological implications where jesus is even implying that he is the god of the mosaic law and these passages exodus 8:19 exodus 31:18 deuteronomy 9:10 and jeremiah 17:13 so we'll just have a quick look of look at them so going back to bible gateway let's examine these passages in the light of that passage what was it first exodus 8 verse number 19 semicolon exodus 31 verse number 18 semicolon exodus sorry it was not exodus it was deuteronomy 9 10 semicolon and then jeremiah 17 13 here we go now exodus 8 19 So now, the context of this passage is the plagues, which uh, one of the plagues which Moses has brought brought down to the power of God on Pharaoh. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, "This is the finger of God." But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. Let's again have a look at this passage again. Okay. but jesus wrote and stooped down on the ground and wrote with his finger as though he did not hear them okay now again let's go to exodus 31 verse number 18 and he made an end of speaking with them on mount sinai that is the lord he gave moses that is the lord god yahweh gave moses two tablets and the testimony tablets of stone written with the finger of god okay all right so again it's the finger of god now but now why did jesus write twice so now some commentators church fathers and some other theologians they state this that jesus wrote the first time when he was writing things about the law for jotting down her sins okay and then why did he write the second time let's go over here deuteronomy 910 uh no 910 is just an echo of exodus 31 18 that 
that's pretty much the same thing. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stones written with the finger of God, and on them were the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Okay. Let's go to Deuteronomy 17, 13. Now, this is interesting. Sorry, Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Okay. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Hmm. This is quite significant because now what happened over here? First point, written in the earth and those who depart from me. Okay. And again, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. In other words, they departed from Jesus. See the parallel John is drawing out over here concerning Christ's divinity, about him being God. They depart, departed from them and he had written them on the earth. Now, just to take a note, some church fathers have actually appealed to some manuscripts wherein some extra point is given over there in this particular verse that Jesus had actually written their sins and names on the ground. Some ancient witnesses have this, although we don't have it right now. Like church fathers like Jerome have appealed to this. Okay. So I guess that this thing vindicates the passage. I mean, rather vindicates Jesus not breaking the law, rather fulfilling the law. In this kind of sense and judging the Pharisees by their own standards. The same way he judged the Sadducees when the Sadducees said that there is no resurrection of the dead. Since the Sadducees only believed in the Torah, that is the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible or the Mosaic law. And Jesus just used the Mosaic law and proved to them that using Exodus 3, that uh, their God is the God of the living and not of the dead. Okay, so... Again, he just used the Mosaic law against them. He applied it against them. They were judged using their same standards. All right. Okay. But now there are some issues as far as the context is concerned. Now, I made that point that Jesus thought that this, I mean, Jesus inferred that this can be a trap. If he says that stone the woman, then Rome would put him to death. And if the Pharisees had, uh, and if he had, uh, said that uh, do not stone the woman and the Pharisees would call him a fraud. Okay. But now we know that in the New Testament, Stephen, Saint Stephen, the first Christian martyr was stoned to that right in Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem. Now, how did that happen? Okay. Now I'll come to that point. There are several reasons, plausible reasons, compelling reasons why that would have happened. I'll just go through them one by one. Okay, so now these are some objections people raise. Now, Stephen, it's thought he died some point between 33 and 36 AD. So if people think that Stephen was stoned right after Pontius Pilate being removed as governor of Judea. Now, if you're reading Josephus' Antiquities, Pontius Pilate was actually losing some popularity at this time. And it's reported that he was no longer governor of Judea sometime in the year 36 AD or say early 37 AD. So it's possible that Stephen would have been stoned at the point uh, at, during those few weeks or months when uh, Judea had no governor. All right. Absolutely no governor at that point of time. And then the Jews were able to take the law into their hands. This is one possible explanation. But then there's another possible explanation because Stephen was stoned very close since the time Christianity began. It's also possible that the stoning of Stephen would have happened before Pilate was removed as governor by the emperor. Okay, so which leaves us with some problems. But again, there are multiple possible reasons, compelling reasons, which could say that this could have happened. Now, say 
this was a violent mob of the Jews who directly immediately had Stephen stoned to death. And Rome did not care about such mob violence because it used to happen every day. Insurrections used to happen. You know about Barabbas, right? He had committed murder and yet he was awaiting trial. He was not yet to be put to death or crucified. These things used to happen. And again, Stephen was not important, politically speaking, like Jesus. As far as Jesus is concerned, Herod knew about him. Uh, the Jewish leaders knew about him. Some of the Roman authorities would have also known about him. For take, for example, the Roman official who wanted his son or his you know servant healed, okay, by Jesus. So technically, if uh, Jesus had done something over there, it would have been utter chaos. If he ordered the woman to be stoned, or if he said, uh, "Don't stone the woman," whereas Stephen was relatively unimportant in the political sense, okay. This is one possible reason. Another reason is Pilate could have been losing popularity with Rome at this point. So the Jews in Judea did not give much of a second thought. Now, why do you think like that? Now, in Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews mentions that Pilate had ordered the slaughter of an entire Samaritan village and Caesar, the emperor at that time, was really upset with him. And uh, Pilate at this point of time was not in Caesar's good, good books. And another thing, Pilate was also afraid of the Jews. You remember that in John 18, when uh, the, the Jews were giving him a not so veiled threat that if, uh, if you do not, uh, you know, get Jesus crucified, then you are no longer a friend of Caesar. You see that? And then Pilate gave in to appease the Jews. So again, Pilate was scared of insurrection, insurrections and all these things happening, else Caesar would have had his head. So I just have a feeling that this could have been another reason. Jews didn't really care about Pilate. You're gone, man. We are just waiting for a replacement kind of a thing. That's another possible reason. Now, another thing about Stephen's murder was, who was standing there when Stephen was getting murdered? Paul who had taken their garments of the murderers who were stoning him, who was to stoning Steve Stephen. And Paul, he was no ordinary man. He had a lot of political influence. Not only was, his, was he a student of Gamaliel the Pharisee, it's also noted by a lot of historians and also scholars and commentators that he had links with Herod. He could have been a relative or a kinsman of Herod. Thus, Paul was a Roman citizen. And there are lots of passages in Acts where, like, for example, Paul had received authority to persecute Jews even outside of Judea. Now, you know that even if Pilate or whoever was governor at this time of Judea, if you're reading Acts 9, shortly before Paul's conversion, Paul got authority from the high priest to persecute people even in Damascus. Okay, to persecute Christians even in Damascus, get them to prison and so on and so forth. Now, where is Damascus? Damascus is, is in Syria. That's outside the region of Judea, frankly speaking. It's outside jurisdiction. And a lot of places, a lot of historians, I can make a comment on this, that Paul was quite popular. Okay, now even in Acts 23, there were some goons who were set to kill Paul off. So when Paul was being escorted off to Rome, to, to Rome, sorry, he was given a guard of over 400 men on horseback when he was being escorted. Now, that's too much protection. Even if you happen to be a member of the Sanhedrin or you happen to be a Roman citizen, why would Rome give more than 400 plus people to send them across? There are lots of compelling arguments that Paul was even related to Herod and the royalty. So naturally, Paul approving Stephen's murder could have made uh, this thing, you know, Rome would not have interfered in this, okay, because of the political influence Paul held. All right. So that could be one possible case anyway. And there are other reasons which I've not stated over here. You guys can just look them up. Now, about this passage, of late, people have questioned its authenticity, whether it was actually there or it's not there. In my opinion, I'm just wondering why it's got more to do with with, you could say, the divinity of Christ, which John is exerting over there. 
and that's why it's not in place. Uh, if you'll check out mainstream scholarship, they'll bash this up. The Catholic Church, however, canonized this passage as official back at the Council of Trent in 1576. Correct me if I'm wrong. There can be some nuances over here. And if you want this passage vindicated and all, forget looking at mainstream scholarship. You could look at people like Dr. James Knapp. He has a YouTube channel and he's also done sessions on different channels like Sam Shamoon's channel or say Cobain's channel or say William Albrecht's channel. And I think even on reason and theology where he has vindicated this passage by providing irrefutable proof, okay, in the form of patristic evidence and other places that this passage, and there's also a PDF, probably I could just yeah, put that link of to his channel in the description box below. And there's also a free PDF somewhere on his site. I can't recall it where, where he has written a paper to vindicate this particular passage. All right. Thank you so much, people. And thanks for watching. Please keep me in your prayers. I'll continue to pray for you guys, the persecuted church, whatever is happening. Save us, Lord, from our own sins and our struggles. Wash us clean by our blood. By our blood. Okay. Thank you, guys. God bless you all. Catch you later, God willing. Cheers.